Good morning, my friends. Lama Jigme Gyatso of the Buddha Joy Meditation School. As you can tell, the wording on the banner seems backwards. That's because I'm using the laptop to record this video and not the cell phone. So if anyone knows how to fix the, uh, adjust the camera settings on the laptop, uh, please call me or, writing, or write me and, and walk me through it. And don't worry about insulting my intelligence. I'm a complete idiot on the subject. Just dumb it down for me. Now, enough of that. A good-hearted fellow from Eastern Europe wrote me. Now, his English is rather poor, so don't judge him. He's a very smart fellow. He's, I have more than one student who is learning meditation in a, f a language that is not their own. And my hat goes off to anyone who does that. So let's not judge him as I read his email. I figured out that aversion against life is good for the non-attachment to life. Okay, there is a very popular mis- Oopsie, come on cell phone, don't fail me now. There is a popular misconception, my friends. Uh, that began in Mahayana Buddhism, oh, I'm not sure began, but very much popularized in Mahayana Buddhism, that we are to, develop, we are to be uh, experience renunciation and complete disdain for all things worldly. In my book, in my view of things, the essence of all a Buddha really taught can be found in the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, the Greater Discourse Upon the Four Bases of Mindfulness. The thrust of that text is noticing, relaxing, and loving. So, according to that text, and also echoed by the Tao Te Ching, it is not our job to choose what we feel. It is our job to notice what we feel, to relax into what we feel, and to use what we feel as fuel for either our compassion or our love. So here's an example. If a tantric practitioner uh, is fortunate enough to receive a truly compatible partner for a long-term relationship. They might feel great joy with the loving response to that joy, to wish that joy on one's neighbors, to wish that joy on one's fellow earthlings, to wish that joy upon each being. What do you do if you feel something negative, like fear? I say negative, I mean painful or unpleasant, like fear. Well, have first experience compassion on yourself and wish that one's own fear be soothed. And then wish or intend that one's neighbor's fear be soothed. And then one's fellow earthlings' fear be soothed. And then each being's fear be soothed. Now, what we're doing, we're not performing magic, we're not Gandalf the Grey, we're not Dumbledore. But we're exercising the muscle of our compassionate or loving intention. And so it's not our job to, to hold on to the joy or to push away the fear. It's our job to notice our spontaneous reaction to that and use that as fuel for our compassion that soothes or our love that seeks to benefit others. But the most, the greatest, the main technique, the primary technique upon the path attributed to Buddha, Gautama, the man who was given the title Buddha, was Vipassana's noticing and relaxing. We're not relaxing what we feel, we're re relaxing into what we feel. 
We're not trying to change what we feel. In a single hour medita meditation session, you could feel a broad range of emotions, from pleasure to pain, from happiness to sorrow, from anger to peace, and all points in between. Our job is to notice and relax. If we do that, everything else will take care of itself. Some people say, man, I want my mind to experience perfect concentration. Well, don't. Let your mind wander. Let your mind flow. That's what it's designed by natural selection to do. When something important comes up, well, you'll notice it. Whether it's pleasurable or painful, it'll capture your attention, at least momentarily. So there is this myth that aversion to the bad things is a wonderful thing that'll make me more spiritual. Um, in Tibetan circles, uh, amongst the Kadampas, there was a teacher who earned the, the nickname, which can be translated into English as the Grim-Faced Geshe. Because he thought it was very spiritual to be have disdain for all things in this world. Eh. Yeah, that's a very efficient way not to be happy or peaceful. So, what should we do with our aversions, our anger, our disdain when it comes up? You guessed it. Notice it on the in-breath. Relax into it on the out-breath. Um, let's see, early, early, early in the pre-dawn hours of Sunday, my PTSD got triggered and I felt intense terror. There was only one thing to do. In the in-breath, notice whatever I felt physically Notice whatever image was cartwheeling across my mind. On the out-breath, relax into it. For no fear lasts forever. It might seem to, but it doesn't. So notice, relax. And that's what gives us the deep, visceral wisdom that so many of us long for. Uh, my friend from Eastern Europe continues in his email. I cannot get rid from a sexual desire. Okay. Most of us were raised in a Judeo-Christian paradigm. We were taught that sex was dirty and that lust was bad and it should be repressed or suppressed or we should feel shame for it. One of the neat things about the Buddhist Tantra tradition from a liberal point of view is that it is neither good nor bad. A desire is simply a desire. I desire to breathe. I think you do too. Please don't run away from the desire. Blue is not your color. So from a Buddhist, liberal, tantric perspective, we notice our lust and we flow with it spontaneously yet compassionately. What does that mean? Well, I mean, it's just because we hanker after someone, we don't chase them with an erect penis if they are not our lover. If we don't have an agreement, a mutual lust agreement with them, then we do not sexually assault them. We do not attempt to manipulate or cajole them or guilt them or seduce them. We behave as gentle men and gentle women, respectful of the boundaries and preferences of others. If you feel warm for the form of your partner and it's in, in that moment they feel the same way, then knock yourself out, kids. Knock them boots. Woo-hoo. Have some fun. While you're knocking boots, you can persist in noticing and relaxing. Men that will prolong the act of love and pre prevent premature ejaculation. 
women by doing that you'll become even more perceptive not only of the coarse pleasure but the subtle pleasure and the very subtle pleasure in um, some Bo ancient Buddhist tantric poetry there is the phrase drunk on bliss which is quite fun now according to Hindu Tantra or many teachers of Hindu Tantra you know coarse reality is not suitable for liberation we have to ascend to very subtle reality through orgasmic orgasmic bliss to enlightenment who did not teach that enlightenment is, in, is available in every circumstance in every sensation convenient or inconvenient pleasurable or unpleasurable coarse or subtle so from a Buddhist point of view we're continuing with the core vipassana practice noticing and relaxing vaginal moistness will come and go erect er, strength of erection will come and go like all things coming and going is a natural part of life in this physical universe so sex is not necessarily a good or a bad thing it simply is and sexual frustration if we're sexual frustrated and we you know and we're we're in public we can't have sex with ourselves you know because you shouldn't you'll get arrested and you'll frighten children but <laughs> you're in a situation where we have no partner and we can't have sex with ourselves and we're terribly frustrated guess what that frustration is not a spiritual indictment it's a spiritual opportunity to practice you guessed it compassion that longs to soothe the greed of others or the inconvenient uh, lust of others or the sexual frustration of others for instance soothe my sexual frustration soothe neighbor sexual frustration soothe earthling sexual frustration soothe each being sexual frustration that just takes about four breaths but it's a wonderful exercise to remember viscerally that the world is more than just me or just you and then go straight to vipassanas noticing the sexual frustration and relaxing into it the Tao Te Ching tells us numerous times the victory comes from yielding and so we do not resist and push against our sexual frustration we notice it and relax it reminds me of a phrase um, from the um, or I should say a refrain from Frank Herbert's Dune called the Canticle Against Fear it goes something like this I must not fear fear is little death that brings obliteration I will face my fear I will let it pass through me and over me and around me I will turn to see that my fear is gone and only I remain and the second part is very much about the yielding let it pass through you let it pass over you that's the greatness pretty impressive that cat's on the back of a chair he's a natural acrobat okay let's continue with the email I don't see the rainbow after the clouds in the practice brave words of vulnerability from my friend from Eastern Europe my friend this is how it works we do not practice to transcend the clouds that we may get to the rainbow the clouds are the practice there is only now there is only here wherever we go is here wherever we go is now if we are continually searching and striving for an ideal state or an ideal circumstance then we make ourselves a prisoner of that ideal circumstance of that ideal state as if to say to herself I can only be happy when I'm receiving this much money this much food 
at this temperature, at this time of day. And what we do is we take the infinite universe and construct it around us until it's our own little private prison. And this little prison is the only place we can experience peace or happiness. That is not the liberation that is offered to us by the Tao Te Ching or the Mahasatipatthana Sutta. The, liber the, the liberation, the freedom that is offered to us is the freedom of being able to deal and cope and flow and even thrive anywhere, anytime, even with the most odious of assholes. That's right, I said odious. So when we get good, when we get really good at noticing on the in-breath and relaxing into whatever we just noticed on the out-breath, then the clouds are the rainbow. The rainbow is the rainbow. The blue sky is the rainbow. The doggy doo that we just stepped in is the rainbow. The email continues. Why to suffer, to break samsara, if I could have everything in samsara, peace, sorrow, joy, emotions, meanings, labels, so one. Okay, so this is my friend who wrote me from Eastern Europe. Good, good heart, good intention. He's fallen into a very common Mahayana trap. So this is the second time I've used Mahayana in today's video. Allow me to explain. Um, amongst the landscape of Buddhist teachings, there are some who would say to divide into three vehicles: the Hinayana, the or Theravada, the Mahayana, and the Tantrayana, or Mantrayana, or Vajrayana, whichever term you prefer. Anywho, Theravada Buddhism is one of the older schools of Buddhism still around. Although it is arguable that everything's changing all the time, albeit subtly, but in form, at least. We're going to play with the idea. It's the older school. And um, the idea, <coughs> the myth, the narrative is that when Buddha was on the scene, he was not teaching a religion. He was just teaching a, a contemplative system, a meditation system. As it grew in popularity, even amongst the royalty of India, and Hindus began migrating into Buddhism, often accidentally they brought with them the preconceptions and their culture and the ideas they'd been trained in since childhood. And so they drag in religious practices and beliefs and theologies and philosophies. And over the decades, over the centuries, over the millennia, Buddhism transformed from a flowing contemplative practice to a concentration practice, from a lifestyle of practicing dependent upon the simplicity of centered spontaneity to that of a reaching and a striving. In that environment, the idea came from Vedanta. Hinduism from the Upanishadic tradition of Hinduism, that what separates us from enlightenment is ignorance, and the veil of ignorance can be pierced through the correct philosophical musings. Buddha did not teach that. Lao Tzu did not teach that. That does not mean it's, in, it's bad or good. It just simply means it's a different path. And upon the path attributed to Buddha, upon the path attributed to the sage, one does not think one's way to enlightenment. Um, spending hours and days and weeks and months and quarters and years exploring um, how all things are one won't make us a Buddha. 
What makes us a Buddha is a habituation, a flow, and noticing, and relaxing, and love. That's it. That is not wax philosophical and try to do in, uh, intellectual acrobatics. Let's keep it simple. It's been my experience, both as a recipient and a provider of counseling, that many of us long for the physiological pleasure. One moment. Many of us long for the physiological pleasure that comes with catharsis, getting stuff off our chest. The problem with catharsis is, although it feels good in the short term, it doesn't provide long-term evolution. It creates the illusion of growth without the substance of growth. That's why a very good uh, meditation teacher, a very good spiritual counselor, will interrupt people when they're trying to cathart. It's far more beneficial in both the short and the long term to be able to bring whatever gurk they're dealing with into the path a flow noticing relaxing and loving that is the most effective system I've, I've ever experienced in this life to deal with the gurk that can bubble up from our heart why do I mention this because sometimes we try to get catharsis, not just by talking about a problem and bitching and pissing and moaning and moaning, but by talking about a problem and philosophizing and, and waxing insightful and transcendental. No. You could talk about the ultimate oneness of all things, beings, and phenomena for an hour and exhaust yourself. And in that exhaustion, feel a modicum of bliss. But that is just the illusion of growth. If we would have spent that same 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes persisting in noticing and what, what's going on and relaxing into what's ever going on, we would have sowed the seeds for true growth. Remember, according to Buddha, according to the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, an alignment can be done in a week. So there's no need for intellectual acrobatics. Well, this has been a particularly long video, but it was a juicy, juicy email as always. If you want my help, you are welcome to it free of charge. You can write me very specific questions here on YouTube in the comments section. Or you can come to my next series of weekly meditation classes, either in person or like most people, over your webcam. Once again, everything I do is free. If you want to come to a class, write me through social media. I'll be glad to hook you up with all the uh, details of registration. Everything I do, everything the Buddha Joy Meditation does, School does, is free. The idea is that Anyone who that these free things are provided because of the generosity through the generosity of patrons and anyone can become a patron if they want to. They can become a patron through PayPal or through Patreon using one of the pages on my on the website Buddha Joy Meditation School. I'm sorry, BuddhaJoy.org. Um, but there you have it. Some people give a lot, some give a little, some give nothing. Come to class, do your homework, evolve. May you and yours be healthy and happy. Bye-bye now.